welcome to episode 14 of Attention Engineer. Kid, a Bristol-based music producer, songwriter and independent solo artist making music as pen friend. In this noisy world, the gift of someone's attention is priceless, so thank you for joining me on my mission to go deeper, past the headlines and the hearsay, to have the conversations I've always hoped for with some of the artists I admire the most. This podcast is supported by Arts Council England and the National Lottery, and powered by the Correspondence Club. Get it? Hello from the Launchpad, where I've been continuing to spend long days working on the Penfriend album. Last Thursday I got stuck into a new arrangement of a song called Sea Shaken, which some of you will have heard in demo form. And like Jay Wilgus Esquire said in last week's episode, most days it really is a case of turning up and putting a shift in. None of my albums so far have been completed by me lying around on the sofa and waiting for divine inspiration. However, by turning up and getting to work, things do start to happen. And I was really surprised and pleased when Sea Shaken, which I wrote more than a year ago, started taking on a new life and suggesting a new direction for the production, how it will sound, and arrangement, all the separate instrumental parts which make up the whole song. It's moving away from a simple strummed thing towards something more complex, with piano parts, perhaps some cello, and some other fun treats I won't ruin by describing here. Recording my own music all alone in a room is a challenge, but it's something I really enjoy, and it's actually a choice I made for myself last summer when I started making this record. Obviously the situation we all find ourselves in dictates what's possible now for recording and everything else, but thankfully I'm able to carry on exactly as I was before, which I'm very grateful for. If you'd like to keep up to date with the progress of the album, plus get your mitts on some exclusive tracks, secret podcast recordings and more fun stuff, please do visit my website penfriend.rocks. I'll send you two free songs immediately when you sign up. Thanks! Now, as a person who produces my own music in my home studio, I was really delighted when today's guest agreed to have a chat with me. She has such an impressive back catalogue and we had a really interesting conversation about the nitty gritty of songwriting, recording and lots more. For nearly a decade, poet and multi-instrumentalist producer Sadie Dupuy has been celebrated for her literary lyrics, accomplished guitar playing and embodied ethos of empowerment, whether with rock band Speedy Ortiz or the pop-oriented solo project Sad 13, which debuted in 2016 with Lizzo co-feature Basement Queens. Self-produced debut album Slugger was released that same year, and follow-up Haunted Painting will be released on the 25th of September 2020. Ready? Here we go. So at what point did you start producing your own stuff? Did you produce the Speedy Ortiz stuff as well? Uh, you always struggle, like, what does it mean to produce something? Good question. <laughs> sort of, I see a lot of people you know, give get producer credit on something that I have not given myself producer credit for, even though I did more quote unquote producer work. Um, yeah. The very first Speedy Ortiz release um, was just me playing everything and recording it myself. So that's mm -hmm. probably the first thing I put out that I had quote unquote self produced. Mm -hmm. um, as far as the full band releases, there's some, there's little stuff on the first album that is stuff I recorded at home, but um, we did it in a studio with an engineer and I mm -hmm. would hesitate to say that, I, you know, I, I wrote everything, but I don't know if anyone was really like thinking as a producer uh, mm -hmm. on that record. Um, we gave ourselves producer credit on the second Speedy album, but again, it was done in a studio. And then the, I did a, the Sad 13 record, um, the first one after that, which was primarily done at my house. Um, so sort of a return to home recording and producing myself. And then the Speedy album after that, I did all the synths at home and some of the guitars. Um, mm. So I would say that that's produced, quote unquote, produced yeah. by me to some extent. But yeah, I never know what the, that word means. <laughs> Yeah. Well, what, yeah, I suppose it's um, for anyone listening who's going, what are any of these words? Uh, yeah. Do you have a way of defining that for yourself, what production is? So if you were to engineer an album, whether as the 
the tracking engineer, the mixing engineer, the mastering engineer. Um, that means you are the one twisting the knob, setting up the microphones, getting the levels, running it through the, the board, the outboard stuff. Um, if you are the producer, sometimes that entails those roles. Sometimes it's about creative vision and you don't touch a single piece of equipment. Um, sometimes it's about arranging and sometimes it just seems like an artist calls himself that because uh they think that's what they did on the album mm. which you know I, I think it can it's such a flexible term it can kind of mean anything yeah I think it used to be a lot more defined when everyone had to go to a studio with people or, or if they had to go to a studio that they would there's no way they could have the technical know-how so you would have to have the engineer who knew how to use all the stuff yeah and then if you're a band who maybe that you don't have a like a defined leader maybe you need a producer to come in and sort of stop squabbling between the band yes when I think of a producer that is outside of the band or the engineer I think of like a guy sitting in the back of the room asking for the bassist to channel some specific <laughs> fantasy and perhaps not using using very colorful language. If I, there was a record and I had nothing to do with any of the engineering or like recording, I probably wouldn't credit myself as producer. And mm. I think part of, even though, you know, the full arrangement is for me and asking for these specific effects is for me and asking for, you know, but yeah. I, I think part of why I started doing Sad 13 is because I wanted it to be more clear that um, I love a lot of stuff that Steve Albini has recorded, for example, mm. who doesn't credit himself as a producer, even though he's no. tracking everything. He always says records by, doesn't he? Recorded, recorded by. Recorded by. Yeah. yeah. Um, a lot of people just say engineered by. And mm. um, if I was going to credit myself as a producer, I wanted to be at least doing some of the, the technical <laughs> work. Yeah, that makes sense. That yeah. totally makes sense. We've been talking for ages, but the people listening might not know who you are. <laughs> oh, hi, people. <laughs> How would you introduce yourself? Um, my name is Sadie Dupuy. I am in the band Speedy Ortiz, and I also do a project called Sad 13. And I'm a poet with one book. Yay. How's that? It's like the most flatline self-introduction imaginable. No, I like it. Okay, and I cool. like the way that I've, I keep reading people describing your music as fun music about real shit. And oh, that like was that. Lindy West who described it that way. Yeah. Do you like that? Is that, is that about right? I, I love it. Anything Lindy West has to say, I love. Yeah. It's nice to have a subtitle for yourself, I think, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a really good one. It's quicker than whatever one I would come up with for myself. So that's good well, it too. it is hard. It is hard to come up with like short, yeah, short versions of what you do. But the poet thing's interesting. And so talking about songwriting, do the lyrics come first because you are a poet? No, <laughs> not ah, at all. Ah, interesting. Yeah, the lyrics are usually the last thing I work on. Okay. I had in my head this sort of beautiful scholarly image of you writing all these reams of beautiful poetry and then deciding which ones would be songs and which ones would go in your books. I think it's really hard to, to take words and set them to music. Mm. That's like its its own job. Mm. It's like a Broadway composer. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Usually I, I, I might have like vague lyric ideas when I start working on something, but I have the bulk of the music done before I um, go about and, and make the lyrics. Yeah. Does the melody come out when you're writing the music as well? Like the vocal melody? Um, does it come out? What do you mean? I mean, does it, does it come along? With the, with the music. So you end up with basically something to write to. Yeah, I ha I'll have the vocal melody before I have the, any lyrics generally. Yeah. So it's usually trying to find lyrics that'll fit mm. the specific passage or yeah. what vowel I think will carry that, you know, run of notes well. Yeah. And that's really interesting. Yeah, I, I, I write in a very similar way. It's just, just because when I listen to your music, there's so much going on lyrically and it's so interesting and so fully fleshed out and you know, brilliant stories and all imagery and stuff. So I just thought, I just wondered if it was a different approach because I end up sort of writing a piece of music, a melody might take me to the next bit, you know, end up mm -hmm. with all of that stuff. I might get lyrics quickly, I might not. I just, I, I don't know, I think it's easy to think as, a, as an artist that the way you do it is like the wrong way. And someone else is doing it in this much more put together, fleshed out way. I don't know. So I just, I'm always interested to know. Yeah. I think a lot of people do work the other way um, mm. where they write lyrics first. But I think 
it's just like to me the lyrics aren't I feel like I always am saying this and feel like a jerk saying it because I think a lot of what people like about either of my bands is is the lyrics. They're like kind of the last thing I think about because I'm so mm. excited by like programming drums, making up, you know, cool synth bass, putting 20 layers of other synth in there. Um, and at the end of the day, it's like, okay, cool. What can I fit into what mm. I've already created with the rest of this? Um yeah. But I think a lot, and I think a lot of people who go maybe lyrics first. I'm, I'm putting up scare quotes. Like listeners can't see me do this, but you can. This is the danger yeah. of, of what doing video podcasts. Yes, I'm gonna make gestures and assume the listeners can <laughs> see me. Um, to add your own gestures. <laughs> yeah, do some, do some scare quotes. Um, uh, what is what am I even saying? Oh, I think a lot of people maybe come up with a chord progression and then do the lyrics and then kind of do the rest, um, which makes more sense to me. I, I really don't know, unless you are like like scoring a musical that someone else is writing the words for. I feel like it's really probably really hard to write lyrics without any melody or music connected to it first. Yeah, I think so. Or I, it just would be impossible for me. Yeah. I tend to write out, I'll write pages and pages of like just sort of automatic writing, sometimes on my typewriter, sometimes longhand. Um, once I've got a song kind of started, because I and if I've got a bit of a germ of an idea of what it might be about, and then I'm trying to find sort of more content. Content's such a horrible word. I don't mean it like content, like the shit we put on the internet. I mean, <laughs> more. <laughs> it used to be a word that meant something nicer. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm trying to find some, yeah, the story or the... Yeah, like all of the imagery and stuff to go with the germ of the idea. So that's when I would write a few pages of stuff, but it's mm. mostly nonsense. And so sometimes some bits lead to other songs, though, so that's quite nice. I do take notes of phrases that I like um, mm. that I will consult if I'm stuck in a song and think I need something somewhere and just can't yeah. come up with the words. So I, there's some amount of that, yeah. Yeah. Your songs are about real things, like Lindy West said. It's about real shit. So do you think that there's just a general like there's just a general message that you're exploring throughout your songs? So naturally you will because you're writing a lot about real issues like, you know, what's the video where there's loads of like fish head men yeah. bothering you? <laughs> Things like that. Yeah. It's really important stuff that you're writing about. Thank you. I think often with if I'm sitting down to work on a song, even if I don't have, you know, obviously I'm not starting with lyrics, I'm I'm going to be writing through whatever I'm thinking about at that time. Um, yeah. And there's just not a whole lot to think about other than all of the things that go wrong in our world every day. Yeah, uh, Bleak, but but unfortunately true for me. So often yeah. I, I wind up just writing about those subjects because that's what's um, at hand when I, you know, need to put lyrics in. Yeah. And do you do any other kinds of writing apart from poetry and lyrics? Do you write a diary or anything? I don't do a diary. Uh, I used to do music journalism, and I mm. occasionally wind up doing things like that once in a while if the price is right. <laughs> and um, this year I've, I've been hired to write a bunch of music, like artist oh, bios, uh, which is like my new favorite thing because it's just about listening to people tell me you know, their process for their albums and they maybe don't have a frame to put around it. And I get to make up, you know, help them get to that frame. Um, it's, I didn't think it would be so gratifying to work on music bios, but every one I do, I just am having so much fun with it. That is very good to know because I've got an album coming out next year. Ah. And I hate pretending that I haven't written the bio. I hate it. Oh my God. I would never, I would <laughs> never write my own bio too hard. I can pretend that I've never done it, but it wouldn't be true. I'm afraid. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure I did in, you know, 2008, but uh, yeah. it's been a while since I had to. You've had the sense to delegate since then, it looks like. That's my worst, absolute worst skill is trying to find other people to help me do the thing better. So <laughs> I'm looking up to people like you a lot. Thanks. So you've been releasing music in various guises. Is it for more than a decade? I started to put music out in high school. So okay. it's been 17 years. <laughs> wow, that's amazing. More than half my life. <laughs> so when did you start writing your own music? I know you were in a choir, professional choir as a kid. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Um, I didn't write any uh, choral music, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, I started making songs when I was maybe 14. I started mm -hmm. guitar when I, right before I turned 13. Mm -hmm. um, 
and I started writing songs on it at, at around 14. But I'd made up songs when I was a little kid on piano and stuff like that. It wasn't totally new to me to compose things. Mm-hmm. Um, but as far as, you know, playing a guitar and and coming up with lyrics to it and starting to record that um, around age 14. That's really cool. It was definitely later for me. I just, I've been trying to work out why. And I don't, I just can't work out why. Because I, I have, I have these regrets of like not having done stuff earlier in so many areas, which is really pointless but it is something I think about (laughs) yeah out of your control unfortunately and I think a lot of um a lot of people I know you know unless they were raised as boys weren't necessarily encouraged to get into rock music or to perform it um I was very lucky to have not only cool parents but I also went to a really cool summer camp um, that had not only a recording studio, but lots of like bands at the camp. And there were lots of girls in, you know, like hardcore bands at the camp. Um, so I think that versus my school where, you know, the only other two kids who played guitar were like really into John Mayer, um, Mm. and like kind of guitar bro-y world. Uh, I was lucky to have that influence. And I think that's what, girls rock camp programs provide for a lot of kids now. Um, Mm. I don't, I'm sure it must've existed in the early two thousands. It just didn't exist near me. Um, Mm. so I was really lucky to have this other camp that, you know, had an active like rock band program and and a recording studio. Yeah. I think it's really important to be able to see yourself Mm -hmm. or your future self or something. And yeah, I I had none of that. We had, um, we had one computer in my music class and I never got to even look at what Cubase looked like. Mm. I never got the opportunity to go close to that thing. Cause when you've got one computer and you've got a load of people who want to do it and they were all boys, they just pushed in. And I, and maybe I didn't push in as well. I'm not saying that I was trying to get on it all the time and, and was denied either. It's just that I never got to, to have a look. Yeah, which is a shame. So it took me quite a long time to get around to sorting all that stuff up for myself. But for me, it was listening to Cat Power albums. It made me go, I could record, and I don't mean that as any diss to her, but it's just, it was what would the community think? Yeah, and it's so that may well have cost loads of money, but it sounded so direct to me. It sounded so immediate and so like right up front. And I just thought, surely I can do that. And then I just went and sorted myself up some fake software and got on with it. So I have to thank her for that. Yeah, she was a big influence to me around the time that I started like recording myself at home. I had a little mm. four track that I probably got around when I was 15. And I really yeah. liked music wise at that time. I was really into Elliot Smith was a really big one, as was um, Bright Eyes, both of whom kind of had that self-recording home recording background yeah um but I also really loved Mira and I really loved Cat Power and Mm. the sort of lo-fi um lo-fi but like awesome songs kind of made me think I could I could be doing stuff at home yeah oh that's good to hear we need that we really need that I know earlier we were discussing what's a producer and there's lots of different ways of looking at it but I think actually it is important when women say that they produce their own stuff if they did because otherwise there's this sort of perception that they didn't basically, or they couldn't. And it was really interesting a few years ago, I think it was now, when Bjork Bjork was um, quoted as saying that there are various men who have just been attributed all of the stuff that she's done on her own records, even though she's Bjork for fuck's sake. And she said, I think it was her, she was recommending that if you are a producer and you're a woman, then you should make sure that you're photographed with your desk or you know at work mm-hmm. producing your stuff otherwise no one can picture you that way you just can't some people cannot visualize this so I found that really interesting something I should do for sure it's funny I, I um the record I have coming out in September um which I produced I play everything on it other than the drums which I have a very amazing BFF drummer Zoe Brecher who um I basically programmed exactly every single part I want her to play on everything Mm -hmm. down to like very minute and humanly impossible fills. Um, So it was sort of for her a matter of figuring out like we, we had to do the drums in multiple uh, 
with with overdubs because what yeah. I what I wrote was not possible for a human. Um, <laughs> although you know, I love that. I tried my best with my my minimal uh, drum playing experience, but uh, and and um, we also had a string section and a woodwind section, and then they played mm -hmm. um, parts that I wrote for them. Yeah, great. So I'm shooting music videos for the album. I just wrapped up the third one yesterday. They have been going slower than it has ever taken me in my entire life. You know, maybe uh, maybe now 23 music videos into my life. Um, they've never taken this long because we're taking all the precautions to be as safe as possible and yeah. um, to have, you know, only one or two people in a room at a time. Um, all that to say, I've been like making sure to get performance footage of me doing multiple instruments in these videos. Cause mm. I think on a record where I played every single thing and produced it, like as much as I love, you know, putting on wigs, putting on wild costumes, being part of a very narrative music video, I think it's really important for people to see like, oh, this person actually played all these instruments maybe that's inspiration for me to do something similar. Yeah. Cause I think a lot of the one person bands that I really liked growing up, so many amazing, amazing, amazing women in rock that were my people I loved growing up, but they didn't play all the instruments. And mm -hmm. I love projects like that where it's just one person like going into mm. a rabbit hole. So I really want through the, even through the videos, even though they're like, they have they're very cinematic and have a narrative i'm like okay we have to get me playing bass and then synth and then guitar so that people can also see like oh i should do a project like that yeah <laughs> i'm really looking forward to seeing that that was such a long-winded way of saying that like the representation of you know being photographed <laughs> with your gear is important but i love that i think that's really yeah well you've reminded me that i need to do that too because i'm in this room making a record i'm finishing it off in August. If I keep saying it out loud, then it will happen. <laughs> mm. It's my own self-imposed deadline, so it could obviously move, but I don't want it to move. I want to finish it. Um, I sit here and all day and I do my thing and it doesn't really occur to me to make sure I'm filming a bit of it all the time, but I think, oh. I think you're right. It is useful to do that. I've never actually filmed myself, but, but I mentioned Zoe, my, my drummer and mm -hmm. favorite person who's got an awesome project too that you should check out called Hush Puppy. Um, okay. But it was really just her and me in the studio, yeah. uh, sort of in different places around the country with various engineers. Um, mm -hmm. And she would just film me doing everything. So I have That's cool. just because she's, you know, she does her drums and then she's stuck in San Francisco with me for five days tracking all the rest of the stuff. Yeah. Um, so I have so many photos on my phone, videos of me like play, like so intently focused playing a weird old synth messing it up and like swearing at myself and then doing it again five <laughs> times my phone is just filled with videos of me futzing around with stuff so you need a bff drummer I do. who will just film you doing like messing up everything i do i do need that <laughs> it's hard to make friends at the moment though considering that we're all sort of stuck we're hanging all... out you know <laughs> <laughs> we are yeah maybe i'll just live stream the recording and someone could take some screenshots like as i go you should. That'd be enough for me. I think that'd be good. Something I've done, I'm not, um, I think I'm great at writing parts for keyboard. I'm not very mm. good at playing it. Like mm. piano is my first instrument and then I just did not touch it between, I don't know what ages, but it had been a while before the last Sad 13 record. And I really had to teach myself. With MIDI, you can just make up any impossible part you can imagine, you know. Mm. Um, and I would pick up these parts that I could not feasibly play. And yeah. on this, this, the record that comes out in September, I did a similar, made up all these parts that are awesome, but I can't play them. And then, but I would want them played on these analog synths that don't talk MIDI. So yeah. I had to be just like obsessively practicing so that I'd be able to produce the part yeah. in the studio. And what something that I do sometimes to make myself learn it better is just to be filming myself. Mm. I have gesturing my phone out in front of me. Um, Cause even if it's not for posting, it's mm. for pressure because yeah. the pressure of feeling like someone is watching me is like what it's going to feel like in the studio. So if I get right at home and I'm just sitting on my couch casual, that's not the circumstances that are in the studio when you are like, I I'm wasting every minute I'm wasting money. Yeah. Um, so I think filming yourself as a practice tool, even not to review it, just to 
feel like someone's in the room, especially now yeah. that you can't have anyone in the room. Maybe get some hot lights as well. So if you make it, yourself really overly sweaty and uncomfortable, like don't drink any water for a while. Yeah, you've got to produce the most uncomfortable situation <laughs> possible. Try and recreate the worst gig you've ever done and then yeah, <laughs> record yeah. that. Yes, I love it. <laughs> How are you feeling about gigs at the moment? Because I know it's different in America, obviously, with what you're allowed to do. We're not going to have them for so long. Really? Yeah. So that's definitely the case here. Why? Do you, are you going to have them soon? What? I don't think so. No, no. I, I really don't think it's going to be till... It's not going to be till next year. I People are think. saying 2022 now for us. Whoa. Ugh. Ugh. The one saving grace of all of this, the problem with the Sad 13 project, as I just told you... Mm. I'm sending like 150 stems before I even get to the studio. Yeah. There is a lot going on in the background. And I really view all that production as part of the, the song and part of the composing. It's not, you know, it's not decorative. It's like the song. Mm. So I perform live. I'm playing guitar. I'm playing synth. And I also use an Ableton controller and I'm mm -hmm. manipulating the session. And it's so much work for me to m remix the stuff different stems than are on the album for live so that I can mess with them yeah. in Ableton. It's just a lot of work that I was not looking forward to doing. And I can take my time now. Of course, I'll probably still procrastinate and do it all two weeks before a tour, you know, whenever touring comes back. Yeah. But I was, it was like the thing I was dreading most having to do this year. Yeah. And I, I don't have to. <laughs> yeah. Have you been doing any online stuff? I did. Uh, I guess I did three. I can't remember. No, I think I've, I've only done two. Mm -hmm. One was for a charity thing with that where they both things paid me. I hate mm -hmm. to play solo. So if it, there's no pay, I'm just not, I'm not doing it. Yeah. Yeah, that's absolutely fair. Have you? I've been really restricting it because I've been doing online gigs for a while. So I started doing them in 2013. Oh, wow. Not all the time, like maybe every three months or so. I did it for a couple of years, every three months, mostly just to my mailing list. And then I stopped for a bit. And then I had actually at the beginning of the year started thinking about because I, I launched a membership club in May mm. for my new project. And I wanted to include a monthly online gig as one of the perks. So I, you know, souped up my system, got it all sorted out like way better quality than I was ever able to do before. And then this all happened as well. Yeah. So that was a weird coincidence you're better that equipped yeah are, yeah which is you know I hate to say anything's good at this time but it's it's handy you gotta find the silver linings where you can yeah exactly so I've been doing just one a month just for my um for my membership club people and I think because I've done quite a lot of them it doesn't bother me that there's no feedback and stuff like that's fine like I don't care that I can't hear applause it's fine mm. and, and I, I think I'm okay with all of that stuff but I mean, it's not it's not a fun thing. It's not the same as uh, being in a room with other people. Obviously, the audience don't have the same experience that they want to have. I don't have yeah. the experience I want to have. It's like it's really a compromise. It's really a very different thing than an actual real gig with people. But it's it's interesting to see that people are doing them. I think that's cool. But I do think there's a problem that it's perceived to be another free thing that musicians yes. do. So it's good to hear you saying that you're making sure you're getting paid to do it because what else is there, you know? <laughs> for me I'm I'm only like making sure I'm getting paid to do them because I so genuinely hate to play solo um like the two that I did I got paid for them but I I, do, I got paid for them and then donated all the money um and it's more that like there needs to be some incentive for me to do it because it brings me no joy um yeah okay and I, the same thing I was saying about you know having to build backing tracks to play live the songs aren't just like the chord structure and the singing to me. It's like the whole, whole arrangement. Yeah. Um, so even trying to translate that to a three piece band is a challenge, but at least a lot of the components are represented. Yeah. Just me playing a guitar. Often what I'm recording on guitar, it's not just like strumming chords. It's, you know, I feel like every instrument is just soloing all the time on all the stuff that I produce. And that mm -hmm. doesn't sound especially that doesn't sound cool to just sing over like, you know, a solo that's coming in and out. Um, so I have to rearrange the whole song to be played in a way that I would never think to arrange it. It's just not, sorry, not to rag on, I'm, I'm seeing plenty of people do solo shows that are cool and I'm happy to hear their songs stripped down in that way. For me, yeah. it's just like, it just feels wrong. Yeah. Yeah. And if it feels wrong, you definitely shouldn't do it. <laughs> but I kind of like, 
I don't know. Maybe I'll come around to it as the months roll on. Well, this is it. So if it's true that we can't do gigs with people in rooms till 2022, yeah. would you consider doing band shows that were streamed, if that was possible? Speedy Ortiz could do it. We all live in the same city. Mm-hmm. Not that I've seen any of that. I haven't hung out with anyone this whole time. No, me neither. <laughs> I'd consider doing anything if I felt like it was safe. Yeah. I've been trying not to read the news much, basically, so I don't know the ins and outs of the situation in America. But I know that here, technically, if I wanted to go into a park and put on a gig, I could sort of do that. So I could probably get people along to watch me as long as they were distanced. I could do that as long as I was a certain amount of metres away from them or whatever. But I have no desire to do that because I don't want to be responsible for people gathering. That's a horrible idea. So I'm not doing it. Yeah. But there are lots of people who seem to want to find some loophole so that they can do the thing they wanted and feel like it's within the rules in some way. And I'm not, I'm just not up for it because I've been hiding at home for four months trying to stay safe. I feel the same way. I wouldn't want to cause any risk for anyone at all. No. Well, aren't we good? Well done. <laughs> I think we're just being normal and anyone who's yeah. not is like... the. I just saw the chain smokers thing where they apparently played in Long Island yesterday to so many people who were not socially distanced and like not wearing masks. Oh it's just God. so the, the, the hubris to try to host a big public event right now. I can't fathom. Yeah. I know musicians are supposed to make everything about themselves, but that's kind of pushing it too far for me. Way too far. Yeah. Yeah. I wanted to ask you, what's the most annoying thing someone has told you that you should do? And that was my air quotes there. Should Mm -hmm. do. Because should is my least favorite word, personally. The most annoying thing? So I feel like I just like wipe it out of my memory. (laughs) That's very... People give me advice I don't like. That's very zen of you. There, I did have um, some people I worked with who basically told me that um, the advice they would constantly be giving me was to like disappear or, and like do less in between projects. Hmm. Um, and it, that's annoying because it's coming from a good place and I understand that sentiment. But as someone who is just really excited by pursuing new projects as they come up and also who really likes, you know, if I get an email from like, a teenager asking me to be interviewed for their like high school zine. I want to be part of that as much as I do a big publication. And I think part of it was like, talk to less press, be more okay. selective about stuff like that. Um, which is just very counter to, to how I feel about music and why I got involved with it in the first place. Mm. Um, so that advice is annoying to me because I understand where it comes from, but I just couldn't disagree more. Yeah, that's an interesting one. Trying to process that. I kind of see that that makes sense in some way as well. But also, we're humans who exist all the time, not just when we're on stage or not just when we've got an album coming out. Mm -hmm. So that's what I find problematic about that personally. It's like, do you create music to market it or do you create music because you just love it? Yeah, are you living a creative life every day or as many days as you can? Or are you just like, yeah, selling a thing once every 18 months? Both. (laughs) Both. (laughs) Everything. All at once. (laughs) And what's the best piece of advice you've ever been given? Mm. Oh, I I have a good one. Speedy Ortiz, I feel like I've said this in interviews before, and if he ever hears me say this, I'm sorry for spilling your secret. Um, (laughs) It's not a secret. Uh, Speedy did a tour with Stephen Alkmus and the Jicks, Mm. and um, he and I both got pneumonia on a tour, Although I think this was the day before I got diagnosed with it and maybe days later Steve got diagnosed. But we were in, we had a day off. It was our drummer's birthday. We were in Whitefish, Montana. It's beautiful there. Mm. And for whatever reason, we all stayed in this really nice like resort type hotel. Um, And everyone got into like a big hot tub. And I was just complaining about feeling exhausted and sick and we had all these radio appearances scheduled um, for Speedy that would just require us to be waking up hours earlier than we would have needed to just to make load in. And Steve was like, if I had said no to half of the radio things I said yes to, I would have a much longer career than I'm going to. Just basically talking about, you know, exhausting yourself by saying, so it's kind of, it's in, in a way, it's similar advice to the one I got before, yeah. but it's more about saying no to be protective of your, your health and sanity rather yeah. than protective of like your brand or your yeah. market. Um, so 
it's very, very hard for me to say no to things. And I've gotten better at looking at something like, yes, this does seem great, but I will get to sleep three hours if I take this opportunity. Let's let's wait it for it for a time when it's not going to, you know, kill my immune system. That is, yeah, that is very wise. So basically he gave you the same advice, but with a decent reason. <laughs> sort of, yeah. It was like, say no to things that will impact your health rather than yeah. say no to things that are too small, <laughs> which like, what does too small mean? This is what's technically known as the middle bit of the podcast, where I remind you all about this great free music I want to send you. You've already had a taster. All the instrumental clips in this podcast are from actual pen friend songs, which I'm really looking forward to sharing with you. It's quick and easy to get hold of two freebies right away. Just visit penfriend.rocks. I said earlier that this podcast is powered by the Correspondence Club, and that is so much more than just a brilliant writing related pun. I've created my own members club, who I hang out with on our friendly forum and send musical treats to, in return for their much appreciated support. Find out more on my website. And massive thanks to any correspondents who've tuned in today. Back to my chat with Sadie Dupuy. So you run your own label, yeah. you produce your own brilliant music, <laughs> yeah. and you make great music videos. But how do you get everything done to such a high level doing stuff independently? How do you organise your life and stay on top of things like that? Um, in terms of like running the label, it's an imprint of Car Park, who um, all the Speedy Records, or most of the Speedy Records have been with. Mm -hmm. um, so in that role basically other than for my own record, I'm really more of an A&R person than anything else. I don't have to deal with, you know, ordering this amount of quantity of vinyl. I just get to say like, oh, I love the color choice or considered, you know, putting the product shot on this different color background. Um, it's more of a helping. There's only two artists on the label, Milk Belly and Johanna Warren. So for those projects, it's really more of a they can bounce ideas off of me. I can certainly make suggestions. Um, as I said, you know, music videos, I've done like 23 or something at this point. I can make, I, I've worked with enough people that, I, and I um, am so often seeking out people as just friends that whose work I admire that I think I'm pretty great at uh, making suggestions for working relationships for my artists, but I don't have to do, mm. it's not like I'm, you know, mailing out every, merch order and doing all that I would just I don't know what I would do I would have no time for anything um I'm laughing because I do every single bit of that and I feel like a fool a fool that I haven't sussed this out yet no not a fool not a fool delegate delegate <laughs> I need to learn I'm trying to learn from you that's why I do this podcast really to try and go oh that's how I should have been doing it this whole time but so what about everything else though so you are doing lots of other stuff aren't you yeah. Um, is it just normal at this point? I don't know. I, I mean, I think similar. I work, I've, I've always um, liked to take on a lot of projects. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm more excited than anything by projects where I feel like I can help other people or work with people I'm excited about. So that certainly keeps me motivated. Yeah. Yeah, that's the thing. Keeping motivation and energy up is key mm -hmm. for all this, I think. Mm -hmm. Do you have anything specifically driving you to keep making songs and music? I just enjoy it. It's my certainly my favorite artistic practice. Um, specifically, recording is just my favorite thing in the world. There's not there's mm -hmm. nothing I like doing more than that. And while I have come to grown to really like playing shows and touring, I'm really just doing that in service of getting to be in the studio for a couple of weeks every few years. Like, yeah, it's just my favorite favorite place, favorite thing in the world. The one thing I am anxious about that kind of makes me want to do some live streams. This is by far the longest I've gone without playing a show, I think ever in my life, mm. at, at least, you know, since I started playing in bands. Um, and I'm scared. I'm just not going to remember how to play. Like, mm. you know, I'm the most I think I'd taken off from playing a show in the last 10 years was like two months. Mm. And even that you just feel kind of rusty coming back to when you're used to touring 10 months of the year. So I'm like, I should just start doing live streams or I'm just not going to know how to play any of my songs. What do you think are your best or most useful characteristics for the life you've chosen? Mm. 
That's a that's a big one. Come on, gone deep there. Um, what are the best care? Almost useful because it might be a terrible characteristic, but it's really useful. Well, I can say something about my like upbringing that I think has been really helpful to me in touring. It's not it's not like so warm and sunny, but um, my parents split up when, before I was a year old, so I was always between their two places, um, and beyond that when I was going to middle school my mom um moved quite a few hours away from my where my dad lived so and they had uh he had I don't know what the word is but you know every other weekend custody oh yeah so it was going back and forth between those places and I got used to just sitting in the car for long periods of time um and every once in a while like as a treat I would just go like get a stay in a hotel with my dad for the weekend somewhere sort of in between and nice. So I grew up used to sitting in the car for a lot of hours a week and used to just, you know, I'm not going to constantly be in my one bedroom. Um, Mm. And I think that really you, I think you have to embrace some level of nomadism um, and not be too, as much as I love being in my home astrologically i'm destined to love being in my home Mm -hmm. but i'm also really really fine just putting stuff in a suitcase and sleeping on a different couch and or arrow bed every day for three months um and it's not one of the healthiest parts of touring and certainly it makes a lot of people with invisible illnesses unable to you know tour or even engage with music to the extent that they should be able to um but I'm really just able to get into that that mode of being. The road is where I live, and um, I think it's served me really, really well. Yeah, yeah, that is really useful. Where, like, you know, bandmates, I have, um, for example, Darl uh, Firm, who played bass on all the Speedy stuff, and is still, like, on some level our bassist, at some point was like, I just don't want to tour anymore. It's bad for my mental health. Mm. And I really understand and respect that, and I think, of anyone I've played in a band with, I'm one of the more down to just constantly tour people. Mm. I know, which is like, again, dangerous for health, but, um, yeah. Yeah. I think that's something that good or bad has allowed me to do it for this long. I think it's really good that he felt able to say that Mm -hmm. because there's so much bravado about like, yeah, everything's fine. This should be fine. I should be loving this lifestyle. This is what I always wanted. And it's not, glamorous and it's not it's not any of the things I think I've heard like audience members assume it is but it's something else that is magical and that's you know the parts of it that I love I can't really quite explain why I do love you know traveling and playing for me I grew up in a family who moved every three years Mm. so I had that nomadic existence I could never really hold on to friends because we just would never see each other again so I have this kind of thing which I think is I think that probably is one of my most useful characteristics for the life I have chosen but it's not brilliant for like being able to form long-lasting friendships because there's a sort of part of my brain I think that's like well this is for now and they're just gonna leave Mm. me it's like that kind of abandonment sort of idea as well that's so interesting yeah and it's I only realized because I was listening to a podcast last week and um one of the creative pep talk episodes and it was this um musician talking about her lifestyle and it was very similar to mine in that moving around and she she went so far as to say that she thinks it's like it's impacted her in that way and I had this light bulb moment of oh that's why and it's just yeah I suppose like you say putting a positive spin on that stuff is really the best way to look at it um, and it's wonderful that your dad wanted to come and make sure he saw you as well. Like that's, that must be hard. It must have been hard for everybody to deal with that situation, but how great that he did come, you know? <laughs> yeah. Something that you just said makes me think too. I think because I did so many weird, um, I think a lot of people growing up, their whole social and hobby, whatever they do is very connected to their school. Yeah. And I had a lot of stuff going on that was not part of the school, um, I had my my dad and my friends from New York City, which was, you know, three hours from where I was going to school. Mm. And up there I had the children's choir. I had summer camp, which was this like cool rock camp. Um, I went to Hebrew school. I had a lot of different little networks. And I think I think for me, I'm really, really good and perhaps better at maintaining 
the long distance friendships because I'm like, yeah, oh, I have these couple of friends in Louisville who are like my favorites. And I'm so excited for the two times a year I get to go to Louisville and see them. Yeah. Um, so if anything, I don't have a very wide network in the city that I live in. But all around the country, I feel like I have two to six friends that I'm like very excited to see every time we come through there. And that's yeah. that's really the thing I miss um, more than. Yeah. But in some ways, you know, you ask what what about me equips me for my job. The thing about my job that equips me for this time is I'm used to a lot of my friendships being people I only see twice a year. So our friendship is based on texting each other and DMing and whatever. So in, in some ways, things feel pretty normal socially for me. Yeah. Yeah. And that's another silver lining, isn't it? I was planning on spending this whole year sitting in this room anyway. And that's what's <laughs> happened. <laughs> so just trying to be as, I was going to say as productive as possible. But there's th- that I used to think that word was really good. And now I think it's not necessarily because it's not about being the most productive you can be all the time. And like it's tied to capitalism. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's not about like squeezing every useful thing out of yourself every day yeah. until you're some sort of desiccated husk. And then you start again tomorrow. It's not, <laughs> not about that at all. But I'm someone who has to be busy. Otherwise, like I had a had a really bad day today when I kind of just stopped and felt exhausted and really upset about the world and various like kind of selfish you know, um, inner critic artist bullshit things that don't matter at all. On a day when I've had enough sleep and I'm not like indulging that in my brain, all that stuff's fine. It doesn't matter. But like every now and again, of course, it's going to get me. Yeah. And then, of course, there's coronavirus and the fact that um, there was quite there was quite a big outbreak down the road from me last week. And I just found out about that today. Oh, no, I'm sorry. It's more like I'm sad for the people who are involved in that. Of course, yeah. It's not going to walk to my house. Do you know what I mean? It's not like flying through the air and through my letterbox. So it's so the proximity almost doesn't really make it any more relevant. But, but it's your neighbors. It's your community. Yeah. It's, you know. Yeah, exactly. Whether or not you know them directly, it's, you know, you're in community with one another. I'm just trying not to make everything about myself in a time of global crisis. That's all. (laughs) Because that's unhealthy as well. Well, you can view, you know, there's only one brain you can view things through. And your reactions to this constant trauma that, you know, people are experiencing around the world is um, going to cause you to feel emotions. So, yeah, yeah. I'd love to ask you how you stay healthy when you are on tour, because you said you were touring 10 months of the year. That is a lot of mm-hmm. touring. How do you handle that? I've definitely had come up with some health problems on, on the road. Um, for, I just told you I had pneumonia and I didn't cancel any shows. I continued the whole tour, oh. which I know now it's very stupid. Um, but I there's maybe two times I've had to cancel something for health and it's because I threw out my back and just simply couldn't do it. Mm. Um, but I think probably you'll relate to this because I think it tends to be a consensus, but there's so much adrenaline involved in touring that even if you are incurring damage to your body or illness, um, you might not, f- it might not hit you till you get home and oh, that, yeah. that adrenaline dose fades away and suddenly your shot immune system hits you with a, you know, two week infection. Um, so I don't know. That's something that, um, I've been trying to strike a better balance with because I do tend to be a workaholic. And when I started touring, I was like, no days off. Um, Mm -hmm. I wound up getting vocal cord nodules, so I've had to sort of set restrictions for myself there where I can't do more than a certain amount of shows in a row without an off day. Mm. Um, and even if a great tour offer comes up, if there are seven shows in a row, um, I can't take the tour Yeah, because uh, it's not worth permanently damaging the thing that I use for my li- livelihood. No, of course not. Um, beyond that, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been vegan for – almost as long as I've been recording myself. Um, I don't even know. Since 2006, so it's been a long time. Um, And I tend to try to eat pretty healthy. Uh, I try to use tour as a way to, like, find cool restaurants and cool things to do in the city that are sort of wholesome. Hmm. I'm not really into staying out late at bars in the way that I perhaps was when I first started touring and it was more of a vacation than a, a job. Yeah. Um, I really try to treat it as, as a job, which it is, um, and not, not do anything that would further inhibit 
my health or ability to perform that job, which a lot of music culture, uh, unfortunately does inhibit your ability to do that job. Yeah, it's strange, isn't it? I've, I've always found that baffling because I've been doing this as a job for quite a while. Mm-hmm. And before I did my own music, I was playing for other people. So even more so, like so I'm being paid to play their songs. You definitely aren't going to get wasted and then fuck that up. Mm-hmm. You're not going to have that job for very long. And yet. So maybe it was that. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. And yet. So many people do. You're right. <laughs> You're right. And weirdly, probably got away with it as well. Yeah, I've always found that kind of strange. I'm the person who, well, also has to like pack the car and then pro- normally drive home afterwards. <laughs> so there's just no opportunity. You're doing too much. Well, this is what I'm telling you. Your this is what I'm telling you. Step in and, and pack the car and drive. That would be lovely. You're doing all yeah. the mail order. You've got a lot to do. This is well, this is it. This is my time to go. Hmm. What could <laughs> what could someone else do? Because this is insane. Yeah. So here's one that maybe this is good for you. I have um yeah. part of why, you know, I, I just said I, th- I throw my back out once in a while. It happened to me a couple oh, weeks wow. ago. I, I have chronic back pain and I have since I was little. Um, I have scoliosis that surgery has been suggested for. I'm getting by fine enough that, um, but it often causes me really bad pain in my neck, like right now. And sometimes um, pain in my wrists and hands, which obviously playing every day is a repetitive stress thing yeah swiping on the phone <laughs> no one can see this but i'm <laughs> pantomiming everything swiping on the phone is the same exact oh, you know yeah connector here um so on tour i'm trying as hard as i can to limit phone use mm. um i'm trying not to be on the computer as much as i am at home and in terms of loading in loading out i'm really lucky that i've had at least in the most recent iterations um bandmates who get that heavy lifting is very likely to throw my back out of whack or give me pain and numbness um, and, and take the most heavy things. Um, And I think especially as someone who, you know, presents as feminine, um, there's a lot of insecurity about letting other people carry your stuff. I know that I certainly was always (laughs) like, I want to carry the heaviest amp, but you know, then I'd throw out my back. So I think being mindful of what my where my body actually is and its limitations and letting my friends help me um, when they know that I'm doing enough other stuff that I don't need to prove myself in this one way, even though there's some psychological thing in me that makes me want to. Mm. That's really, really important for me on tour. Uh, I'm just kicking myself so much listening to you because you're so right. Even like driving, if you're driving all the time, that can cause sciatica, which is another like thing Uh, that can throw your back out because you're just the pressing onto the gas is bugging that specific yeah, sciatic yeah, nerve. Yeah. So I don't really drive on tour. I try to just be really careful of my body. You are wise. You are so wise. <laughs> I think it comes from being a teenager and starting to play in bands and not wanting to be any extra trouble. Honestly, that's yeah. what it is. It's like, I that 100%. don't want to be kicked out of the band for being a girl because girls don't help with the amps or do the things or know how the things work. So I learned how all the stuff worked. I learned how to put the PA up. I put the PA up by myself, you know, lifted all the stuff. I remember there was a tour I was doing. I can't remember who it was with, but I knew that we'd be, there's a lot of amps <laughs> for some reason. And I remember actually doing loads of extra kind of weightlifting stuff in the weeks mm-hmm. leading up so that I could carry all the stuff i mean if i'm doing exercise and weightlifting it is only so that i can go through tour without yeah like I, i'm not really interested in strength training it's very boring to me mm-hmm. i like other forms of exercise but if i'm doing it it's like so i can tour and play music without pain yeah yeah but i totally get that i remember going to see um just going to see Pi. my friends that are in the band pile mm. uh really early on right when speedy was starting and I'd go see them and I'd be like, give me your biggest amp but I'm going to carry that for you up two flights of stairs. Yeah. And I think when it's a one-off situation or if you only tour two weeks of the year, it's easy to get into that routine and it's fine. But when it's an everyday thing, that's when you're going to cause yourself, you know, chronic overuse injuries. And There was one occasion as well where there was this... I was playing bass with someone and I, I didn't ask for this giant amp, but someone hired in or I don't know, it, it was mm-hmm. it was provided in some way. It was big, ridiculous amp that no one needed. It, it didn't need to be that big, but it was. And so because it was like the one I was using, I felt really responsible for it, even though I hadn't booked the stupid big amp. Yeah. So I was like, oh, I have to help carry the amp. And someone nearly dropped it on my wrist at one point. And I was like, hmm, maybe I won't be able to play the bass for money tomorrow 
for this artist I've been playing with for a year if someone fucks up my wrist for me, you know? And that was that was a bit yeah. of a wake-up call. And I think I, I may have had a bit of a pause of helping so much. but I'm all about the light amps too. Yeah. What's the point? They don't need to be heavy or huge. Yep. So you mentioned trying not to use your phone so much on tour for physical reasons, for health reasons. Mm -hmm. What's your relationship with smartphones and social media generally, though? I love to use Twitter. Um, I'm less like sold on Instagram, but Mm. it's fun. It's, you know, I like to write more than I like to do other things. So it makes Mm -hmm. sense that I would prefer to be on Twitter just to make stupid jokes and yeah. uh, read people's stupid commentary on the horrible things happening in the world. Um, I loved your tweet today that said, Siri, when is this going to (laughs) end? I think I typed that at 3 a.m. last night and was like, no, this is for the morning. Um, I appreciate that. On tour, there's a lot going on. I'm I'm less um, in need of the gratification of doing this. I like to, if I'm in the van... I think partially because I'm being conscious of the wrist and hand pain. Mm. Um, I read a lot on tour. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'll, I read more books on tour than I do at any other time because I'm lucky I don't get car sick. And so there's not really the temptation to be on my phone constantly. It's like read in the van. Once I've gotten to the venue, there's stuff to do until we load out. Um, and maybe I have checked my emails in the morning and that's that's it Mm -hmm. in quarantine times i am on this shit all day long just scrolling through twitter and instagram and i think part of it is a nighttime anxiety thing Mm. um especially the past two months of the protests and demonstrations happening around the country Mm -hmm. wanting to know what's happening in you know all the cities where people have been out in the streets every day but it's i'm using the phone way more than i ever have and i do not like it Mm. i would like to be less and it's not even like a social media, you know, if I make a post on there, I kind of step away, but it's reading about what are the police doing? Mm-hmm. What are the feds doing now? Scrolling through news and then scrolling through the on Instagram, it'll be the infographics about, um, you know, anti positive things like mm-hmm. anti-racism, um, but also about, you know, more and more black people who've been murdered by police and um, how, we can support them with money or support their families mm-hmm. with funeral funds, but it gets very, very bleak and I'm, I'm on the phone way too much. And it's because it's important stuff to not look away from, but yeah, um, it's been really hard for me to find any balance the past few months. Yeah. I, it's something I struggle with all the time. Um, I didn't help myself today by scrolling, scrolling, scrolling mm-hmm. normally at the moment, especially cause I'm in a very controlled state. I'm in my house all the time. I have a system of, system of putting my phone in the cupboard and closing it and then coming upstairs and working I have to hide my phone too yeah and then I have an app called freedom on everything which blocks me from certain times from from being able to get on certain sites at certain times Mm. but I I left my iPad freedomless (laughs) so that I could just be like so and I'm miming scrolling now (laughs) that's what that noise is (laughs) and I was just you know just yeah and I just, I feel like my brain's been like dipped in sugar or something. And it's it, not in a nice way, like not in a, I had a lovely treat, but in a, ugh, I feel sick. Mm. Um, and it just made me more and more upset today on a day when I was just feeling shitty anyway. I don't know why I was doing it to myself because I know that that's going to make it worse, but I did it anyway. And for me, I think it's like, I think you're right. We need to know what's going on, especially when it's stuff that's so terrible and especially when there's stuff that we can do. If there's nothing I can do about something, then I think there's limited... I think that I maybe shouldn't be focusing on it so much. If there's literally nothing in the world I could do to change that thing and it's going to make me feel horrific. If there's nothing I can do, that's going to make me focus on it even harder. Really? I feel like the helplessness yeah. puts me... Um, well, we could, I mean, this is, <laughs> I keep talking, this has come up two other interviews today. Um, I have OCD mm-hmm. and um, I, if I feel helpless about something, researching it just to a disgusting extent to the, the detriment of everything else I have to do that day, mm-hmm. I kind of can't stop myself from it, yeah. um, especially pertaining to like, issues surrounding death Mm. um it is like a real trigger for me of wanting to just know everything i can about and in some ways you know what you can do like positive is there a memorial service i can donate to Mm -hmm. um 
but just about the person. It just makes me feel very, very helpless. And for whatever reason, having as much information as I can gives me some like like false sense of control. I think that makes sense. It's not good though. I've really been working on it the past um, couple years in therapy, really. But mm-hmm. um, yeah, it's a it's tricky. Yeah, I would like to be on the phone less. Yeah, I suppose what I'm what I was saying though the angle I was taking there was like if it's something I can't do anything about at all yeah I think I shouldn't know about it because there is no point yeah have you heard about the information action ratio no that's another thing for you to look up on wikipedia (laughs) after we've talked I've been reading about it there's this incredible book called amusing ourselves to death by Neil Postman and it's funny it came up in a podcast episode I did with Emma Pollock from the Delgados last year that I just put out last week and yeah, she's amazing. But she mentioned it and I'd never heard of it before. And then I started reading this book, which she had not recommended to me. And I started reading it the week that that episode came out, even though I recorded it ages ago. And there's this whole section about the information action ratio in there. And it's essentially the more uh, society is deluged with information about stuff that has absolutely no context in the sense that they can't do anything about it. Yeah. Then the, the more powerless they feel and the worse they feel and the more anxious they feel. Mm. And it's true. It's clearly true. You know, this book was published in 1985. Couldn't predict all it's, this. It's yeah. way before internet, way, way, way before social media. And it's, and it's about the rise of television versus the, the age of typography and the differences and the, you know, the pitfalls are coming ahead, basically. And he may as well be talking about social media. And I'm not, I'm not 100% down on social media at all. It has been incredibly useful for me to build an audience in a time that's very different from, you know, the way the music industry worked before. I just know that today I looked at it all day and I felt awful. Yeah. And I know that if I hadn't done, I would have felt not so awful. And that's, that's all I can say, really. And the worst my, the worst my mental health is, the more I'm inclined to look at it all day long, which yep. is just gonna make me even feel even worse the next day. Yeah. Yay. <laughs> Lucky <laughs> us. <laughs> This is what everyone's tuned in for is to hear us go, oh, everything's terrible. But I think it's good to be real about this stuff. Yeah. I think that um, it's a problem for a lot of people, but it's quite hard to talk about it. And I'm, I bring it up because I think it's something that because artists use that stuff to not only have, you know, a, an online social life and talk to friends and stuff, but to market our music and to to reach fans and talk to fans and build an audience and stuff. So it's really integral to what we do. You you know, someone in your team or you has to deal with that. Mm-hmm. There's no way of ignoring it completely. I think I'm I'm lucky in that the the posting itself isn't what stresses me out. And I know for a lot of artists that's not true. Um mm-hmm. I have a good time, you know, making stupid jokes on Twitter. Yeah. If I go on there to to post something, it's because I am I'm, I'm having a good time with it. That's like how yeah. it should be used. Yeah. For me it's more of the the voyeuristic aspects of it that I mm-hmm. get into a troubling zone for me, whether or not it's about something, you know, sad and true about the world. Sometimes even just looking at the way other people use it and um, mm. it's like, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Ah, we can't go outside. <laughs> I know exactly what we were supposed to do. But um, I think as well, even just it's, it's as simple as, I read too many little things about too many things today for my brain to handle it. Yes. My, my brain can't handle. No. Nope. However, I don't even know how many hundreds of things I read today that were all different and decontextualized pieces of information that had nothing to do with my life and I have no control over. And that's why my brain just goes, Whoa, can't deal with it. You know, it's as simple as that. Yay. Ooh. Yay, internet. It's good in some ways. It's good in lots of ways. Yeah. Do you have a generally positive time with fans on the internet? nice people talking to you and saying that they think you're great the gesture you just missed is me rolling my eyes yeah for the most part (laughs) i have a good time i think sometimes um because i enjoyed using twitter and before that live journal and so many internet tools prior to having my very minor level of like recognition Mm -hmm. um i sometimes forget that not everyone on there is just like my friend yeah um And I can get into, you know, across all the platforms, there's, you know, close to, there's a hundred thousand people who probably some of them are duplicates, but in terms of followers, that's a lot of, of strangers probably. Um, and I think sometimes I, when it can stress me out is 
I post something and forget not everyone's just my buddy and I get some kind of weird or stressful response. Um, and I have certainly come into fans, which I probably shouldn't even speak to too specifically, but fans who just have scary um, mental health stuff going on that, that, you know, is delusional about their connection to me or relationship to me. And um, yeah, I've definitely had some, some frightening moments from, Stuff like that. Yeah. But for the most part, you know, I do kind of view everyone as my friend. And if I'm at the merch table talking to someone, I'm like really excited to get to know them. And I've made friends that yeah. way. Um, and I've certainly like made friends just from chatting with people who replied to me on Twitter. So, yeah, I feel like it's the same thing I said earlier. I got into playing in bands just because I wanted to make friends. And I started Speedy or T's as a full band because I wanted to be able to play shows so I could meet people after having moved to a new place. Um, so I still very much view making music as more than anything, a way to get to connect with other people who might be interested in some of the same things I am or, um, yeah, you know, be positive to each other in some way. Yeah. And that's the absolutely amazingly wonderful thing about all of these places. Those people are there and they want to hear music and they want to engage with, with what we're doing. It's brilliant. But it's just too optimistic sometimes. <laughs> Yeah, but I don't know. I think, yeah, I choose to live optimistically mm -hmm. most days <laughs> because the alternative is just no good. I would be better protected if I were more jaded, but I just have not gotten there yet. <laughs> well, that's good to hear. You have talked to me for ages, which is lovely. And um, I think I could probably talk to you for many more hours, but you've probably got other things to do. I have something so... cool to do after this. Do you want should I tell you? Yeah. So with this album that's coming out, we've been doing sort of special merch for each single. Um, I'm really interested in not only sustainable merch, but like actually useful merch um, so that it's not just going to wind up in a dump in two years when yeah. they don't like this album anymore. Um, so for the first single, we did a hot sauce. And the second <laughs> single, we're doing like a custom hot sauce blend that's specific to you know, what I wanted and what I think the album sounds like. And for this one, it's going to be a tea. And the guy who made the tea, yeah, it's craftteaguy.com. He's based in Philly. <laughs> he works with a lot of music venues. Um, and he's done a lot of vinyl tea pairings. It's very, like, high-end, sustainable farmers, stuff like that. So he's coming yeah. to drop off the tea blend for me to try and approve. And he'll be here oh, awesome. probably any minute. What flavors are in it? Well, the album's called Haunted Painting. Uh, the hot sauce we called it haunted peppers because it's like a ghost pepper <laughs> um this one is going to be called haunted breakfast as like a, hey. like a black tea um but i believe it's an assam blend with lapsang suchong because i really like smoking Ooh, teas and i think nice. the assam was harvested under a full moon in ne in nepal it's like it's called like blood moon tea or something wow uh, so it's the tea itself is creepy that's a very exciting thing. It's like going to be the, the you talking to you is the highlight of my day. This is number two. <laughs> Flattery will get you everywhere. Thank you. Yes, thanks. <laughs> Let's wrap up then because you've got tea guy on, on his way. I'm going to brew a pot so <laughs> quick. <laughs> Which three pieces of your own work would you recommend as a gateway for new listeners? Might as well to start with the new stuff because that's what I'm, what I sound like right now. Uh, so the album is called Haunted Painting. It'll be out in September. By the time this comes up, I think there'll be three songs from it out. Brilliant. Anything I've been talking about here with like too many hours programming since uh, was for this album. Beyond that, I feel like if I were promoting myself well, I'd say check out my, my own poetry book. But I've been editing a poetry journal um, that's not my work, but it's really cool called Wax9. It's it's for my, my imprint. Um, so if you go to wax9.com slash journal, you can read lots of the poets that have been submitting and that I think are awesome and that I've been psyched to get to give stipends to, to publish their work. So just check out a bunch of random poetry. That's not by me, but edited by me. So <laughs> my second recommendation. And I guess third, I should say speedy RTs since that's sort of the, my, the, my primary source of income, um, yeah. my, perhaps my only <laughs> source of income. Um, I think that again, the most recent album mm -hmm. is my favorite that we've done. Uh, Cause it's, the closest to what I'm interested in now. Yeah. Um, so check out Twerp, Twerp Verse by Speedy Ortiz. Very cool. And do you have any favorite videos that you've put out so far? The one I did um, for the, the, the first video I did for this album called Ghost of a Good Time, I got to mm -hmm. work with one of my really old friends, El Schneider, 
um, when we were working on the video, I was like, we've known each other 20 years. It's crazy. Wow. Um, so she's just an amazing filmmaker in person. And this was, we shot it just over a month ago. Um, just the two of us with her doing everything. And it took so long. We thought it would be a three day shoot, which already is a lot of time for just two people, but it, it wound up, I think a full week. Um, but just her sort of meticulously setting up every single light and making sure everything was perfect. She basically did the jobs of 12 people on a film crew by herself. Wow. Um, so not only do I love the video cause I think it's really fun. It was just cool to get to see my friend accomplish so much by herself while also like being, we shot in an abandoned, not abandoned, but a vacant um, motel. So mm -hmm. we had kind of the run of the space and we're able to do it safely and just watching her, do all of this herself was a cool experience yeah brilliant well i really love that video i didn't i, I didn't know anything about the story behind yeah, it so that makes yeah, it even really more cool French. it's the same person who did the villain video actually that you uh, mentioned okay. earlier yeah. um she's great you have to hold on to these people not only because they're your friends but because they no, but great like, you know we've been friends 20 years like just collect them all from tiny different places and uh never stop loving them oh that's lovely <laughs> So in 20 years, we're going to make a video together. And, uh, <laughs> I'm going to put it on the calendar now. Let's do it. I'm up for it. I'm totally up for it. We'll be able to travel by then, surely. I, unless the plane <laughs> comes back, which apparently, whatever. <laughs> mm -mm. Speaking of love, which three other artists should we all be listening to? Um, what am I listening to? <laughs> You're catching me at a funny time because I... I'm DJing an emo night in two days. So I was kind yeah. of trying to put together my playlist for that which obviously skews very um, 90s, but I put a couple recent <laughs> things on it. Um, Mustang by Bardi's Strange is really cool. Uh, mm -hmm. He's a great new artist that's, I think this is the first single for a new album. Um, I also put Ganser on there. They're an awesome Chicago band and they're, well, we're, we're taping this in July. So whenever people mm -hmm. hear this, it'll be out by now. It comes out on Friday. So I'm very, very excited for that record. It's just really awesome guitar riffs. And um, the, it, I've been making a lot of new Twitter friends in the pandemic. And these are people I'm very excited to meet someday when we're allowed to. Um, there's a, a quote unquote mixtape by Illuminati Hotties that came out a few weeks ago. Um it's which is a band that's fronted by my friend Sarah Tudson, who did a lot of engineering work on my record. She's a really amazing producer, and it's such a cool record slash mixtape, um, just in terms of lots of different sounds. And I feel like every rock rock subgenre you can imagine, she's able to channel pretty perfectly in like a sixteen minute album. Uh, oh, so wow. it's really really cool, and that's it's called Free IH. My final question is, who would you like to hear next on this podcast? If you could have anyone Ooh, talking to me. Any person in the world. Um, I am very obsessed with this rapper, producer, songwriter, Backwash, um, mm -hmm. with an X in between Back and Wash. She yeah. is, I think, Toronto-based. Um, I started following her on Twitter just because I was really into the album that she put out which I probably would have also recommended in my top three if I had thought about these questions that you gave me in advance. <laughs> um, too much going on. But um, she's she's so funny. Her Twitter, just mm. every day, even I don't especially care about gaming. I'm not like, I'm definitely a nerd, but not in that corner. But even just her talking about gaming, uh, mm. I just love everything she has to say. So I feel like she needs to be on some podcasts so I can hear more. That sounds good. I just realized this afternoon that you've um that you know computer magic. I do. Have you had her on here? No, but I'm gonna ask her now. I've remembered that she exists in the world because I got super into her music probably about five years ago and then probably didn't follow the right things and, and sort of I don't know, just blanked on her for a while, yeah. which is awful. I hate it when people do that. But only today I was just like, whoa, because she did the, she produced the track you did with Lizzo, right? This is another one where I'm like, I probably should have given myself producer credit. <laughs> Because I made uh -huh. the track at home. We went yeah. into the studio to do overdubs just on the drums and vocals. Mm -hmm. And then Dan's, like, um, she she kind of mixed. I mean, she definitely did 
sometimes mixing involves production work too, but yeah. I should, we should probably have credited both of us as producers, but yeah. I was so in my head about, I didn't engineer the drums and the vocals, so I'm not the producer at that time. You didn't, you didn't lift the amp up the stairs that day. You can't have any credit. <laughs> I know. I feel differently about it now. But she yeah. is amazing and, and yes. truly not only a great producer, she's been doing like a very cool synth archiving yes. uh, account that I'm fascinated by. I, I Both in real life and as a fan, I love her. Yeah, she's incredible. Well, look, I'm going to let you go and um, hang out with your tea guy. Oh my God, I can't wait. But thank you so much for talking to me. It's been really lovely. Yeah, absolutely. Really lovely to meet you. This is really fun. <laughs> and I am excited to hear your future episode with Dan's. Yay, fingers crossed. Well, I hope you enjoyed that conversation anywhere near as much as I did. Please go and pre-order Sadie's new album, Haunted Painting, wherever you get your music. And visit the deluxe show notes for this episode at penfriend.rocks forward slash Sadie for links to everything we talked about. If you enjoyed what you heard today, please subscribe to the series. Your ratings and reviews would also be very much appreciated. Next week, I'll be sharing my conversation with Estella Adieri from Big Joni, who completely coincidentally toured supporting Sad 13 a few years ago. It's such a small world. Till then, thank you so much for listening. Make sure you grab those free songs from my website. Take care and stay safe. <laughs>